Hey there. Yeah, you. Welcome to Ergo, episode 100. I'm Kiss. Uh, Damon stepped out for a minute. We are very excited to be bringing you episode 100. You know, the number doesn't really, you know, tangibly mean anything. But on our end, it's been fun to take, you know, a couple days to, to take a step back and think about all of the conversations, all the people, all the relationships uh, that we've brought to you over the first just about two years, a little over, of this show. For episodes 100 to 105, we're going to have repeat guests, folks who have been on the show before and we want to kind of catch up with, hear about what they've been working on, maybe have a chance just to talk a little bit longer. Uh, for this 100th episode, we bring back uh, the wonderful Miriam Kaba. Miriam is an organizer and educator and community builder and humanizing voice of the highest regard. She's on Twitter at Prison Culture, which is a great follow. But before we get into the interview, uh, Damon and I just want to share our thanks to all of the people who have come on the show, all of y'all for listening. It has been such a joy having this show as one of the few kind of grounding, continuous, consistent pieces of our lives as the world goes through its ups and downs and we continue figuring out new ways to imagine a new world. So thank you for listening. Without further ado, episode 100, Miriam Cabo returns. I'm just excited. Oh, yeah. It's a good time. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing. We are here uh, in Detroit uh, on the Wayne State University campus. Uh, Ergo Studio L at this point, I think. Gamma. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing this new thing where we interview our biggest fans. <laughs> <laughs> we are so excited to welcome back to the show, Miriam Cabo. Hi, everybody. I'm just happy to be back to Ergo. Oh, wow. Oh, the, 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 the blush. The, I'm blushing harder than Daniel right now. Um, so we always like to start, if we are being intentional, how is the world treating you? How are you treating the world in this season, in this time? The world is treating me well. I'm also trying to reciprocate. Um, I'm tired. It's been a very long week for me. Um, and uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff while I'm here in Detroit. And I'm actually ready to leave to go back home to New York this mm -hmm. afternoon. And I know how much you love airplanes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> what a nightmare. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about just we, we, we ran into each other yesterday at the end of a long conference day. And you were talking a little bit about how different this conference feels one from what it was before but also just the spaces that were kind of the the equivalent when you were our age yeah um we'll get into all of the other things that you've been up to and go circle back but I, I think it's kind of kind of cool to to think about the whole model of like what we do internally is then how we it's we're modeling it to ourselves so that we can model it to the world mm -hmm. um what is exciting to you about this space? Uh, what have you seen? What have you heard? What, what stands out? Sure. Well, I think it's a unique space, um, the Allied Media Conference. First and foremost, I think uh, the way that they define media mm. is very expansive, yeah. right? Um, and it incorporates so many different kinds of things, things that you wouldn't necessarily think about media, you know, dance or radio and digital organizing and all of these forms that people use to communicate. So anything that we use to communicate, that's a broad, food, you know, everything. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. To build communities and communicate. So I really appreciate how expansive their visions are. I love the fact that how intentional they are about being inclusive without it being self-conscious. Yeah. Every type of person really is welcome in this space and they 
try to show it. They try to yeah. demonstrate that. So anywhere from seeing the signs that are around here, directing people to where they can go to childcare, directing people about accessibility, directing people about any number of things, safe spaces and who to call for the safety yeah. team. They spend a lot of time training up volunteers to make sure that if somebody is needing anything, that somebody's there that can respond in a, in a really timely way. So that's just one part about like kind of the mechanics of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just think that the, the fact that so many um, young people have a place where they can congregate to learn together and also to reflect on their practice in order to be able to take that into their work and in their lives and into their organizing in various ways. It's just, um, it's unique. So what was a like big ideas conference like when you were, let's say, 25, like those first conferences you went that to? That I went to. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, how was how were the DJs? <laughs> <laughs> we did not have DJs oh, for the well. most part. I'm sorry to let you know. <laughs> we didn't have DJs. We had the, Trotsky. We, <laughs> we had a, I, I said this to you all yesterday that I um, the the conferences I went to were like Marxist Leninist conferences. That's kind of what we had available for our political education in the mid 80s when I started uh, organizing in, in New York as a as a young person. Um, you know, all of the people who went to those were many, many years older than I was. I was one of the few, few, few young people in those spaces. Always. I was always the youngest. I was always singular in, in my presence in those places. In some ways that made it great because I got some mentors out of it that probably other people didn't access but at the same time it was really isolating in many many ways yeah so so when you see this space now which in many ways it's not a standalone right it it is an embodiment or a manifestation of kind of where we are right now beyond like the theory or the analysis of like how how it has gotten to like a more if we want to call it dynamic space emotionally how does that feel, right? Because you've been so intentional for so long about future building, right? Right. So to live in this future, right? To, like, how does it feel to see that this is available? Yeah, so many people that, I that mean, you've poured into. It's really hard for me. I'm not a feelings person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, we're gonna push back against that. I, I don't really. I'm really not. I'm not really. I'm not. I, I'm too analytical sometimes. Mm. I'm too cerebral. I live in my head quite a bit, and so I think. I wanted to say that to say that this kind of a space forces you into living more uh, dialectically between your head and your heart. Mm. Like they intentionally try to make that the case so that you are here and, you know, you're talking about DJs and the parties that are here and the uh, kind of the, the intentional friendliness and the people who hug you. You know what I mean? Like that's really part of that for me. It is a product of having grown up in a different kind of setting where we prized the mind over your emotions. Like I was taught very much like you think yourself into being. Mm. You don't necessarily feel yourself into being. And in fact, feelings were kind of like discredited I, I you know it wasn't just that I was in a Marxist Leninist or Nation of Islam spaces or but it was they were masculinist spaces right. so as a young woman I didn't tap in it was seen as kind of like you know she she you know yeah. weakly weakling like kind of sentimental that's not real politics right. I grew up at a time when this is like liberation politic right. you know people that I was being mentored by had been organizers in the 70s and the 60s mm-hmm. so they they had a very kind of different idea mm-hmm. y'all like the, the world you're growing up in the world this space embodies is so different from that yeah. I'm not going to, you know, make a distinction between whether that's all good or all bad. Yeah. It just is. You're growing up in a space that's so much freer to yeah. you're freer to be your full selves. Yeah. I didn't feel like I was being mentored into spaces that would allow me to bring every last part of myself into that space. They, they prized particular parts of me. Right. It's like building that part as opposed to like trying to build a person. You know? That's right. It was like, well, we're, we have like there's a lot of stuff we 
got we're fighting against. Like, right. what are you going to contribute? What, like, exactly. Buck up, right. people. Right. Like, fight. You know, yeah. you got it. Like, that was the the mentality. Yeah. It wasn't like you know, how do you feel about this? Yeah. Like, there's, there's two pullouts from what you just said. One, I've been really interested in, in wanting to study kind of the generational epochs post kind of like the popular Black Freedom Movement, mm-hmm. uh, and I want to get your take on kind of like the in between that you kind of were mm-hmm. nurtured in. Mm-hmm. But something you said that was like a book. Like the dialectic between heart and mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really want to pull that out because like dialect is something I'm really trying to like internalize in my bones. Mm-hmm. Uh, so can you just unpack that 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 concept for us or yeah. how do you use that or understand it or teach it? Well, I think I became conscious of the way that I was uh, socialized into organizing when I maybe was in my early 30s. Mm. I started working with young black women through um, a project that we co-founded called the Rogers Park Young Women's Action Team. And I really credit that work to like the being the bridge between where I was and how I was socialized Mm -hmm. to beginning to understand or have a have a philosophy myself of how people should be organized. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was the work with those young women who I spent almost 10 years with. It was seeing that like their lives had to be part of the soup of the organizing because they were living complex and difficult lives. So it wasn't that we could just separate out and have a wall between what we were organizing for and then their living and lived experiences. Those lived experiences had to be part of the soup of the organizing itself. And I wasn't trained in that way. And I went to, uh, you know, I went to five days with IAF, you know, Industrial Arts Foundation. And those were trainings about like your self-interest. You agitate and like you rub the sores of discontent and you know, whatever. And they were old white men and they were the ones leading the trainings and they were yelling at us and they were like, and we had targets and we were doing hits and we were like, you know, and it was they like had their everything. Own personal sores of discontent. Right? Like, I mean, and, and yeah, and our organizing was public and you door knocked and you did. And it was like, well, if you're organizing around certain kinds of things, you may not want to door knock. And what if you're in a community where you're a young woman and you can't go by yourself to door knock? And like all these ideas that I hadn't really connected. So that connection between head and heart became clearer to me as I experienced doing organizing with these young black Mm -hmm. and brown girls. All of a sudden I was like, oh, okay. That's why no young people were in those spaces that were like me. <laughs> That's why, you know, no young women were present in the, like, because that didn't speak to their lived experiences at all. And they couldn't bring their full selves. And yet I don't want to go too far where all we do is discuss our emotional stuff and our feelings. I, I still recoil yeah. when people say, no, that is itself organizing. No, that's that's moving toward healing. That's That's consciousness raising. That is healing from trauma. Those things are important too. But organizing demands you to do something for others. And obviously you benefit from it too. It demands for you to actually transform the material conditions of the people with whom you're actually you have can't to just organize yourself. You can't just organize yourself. It doesn't even make sense. You there is an external outside you part to that work. So I feel like in some quarters people have gone too far on the internal self yeah. healing stuff and calling that itself organizing yeah. that I feel like we have to push back on. Yeah, it's interesting, right? We talk about this a lot that you know, we say you can't organize yourself, but that can be a part of the piece, right? So a process or a a new way of thinking can be kind of explored like internally, interpersonally, communally, and then like on a larger scale. So the idea of this happening all at the same time, that that can kind of put things into practice, I think, but it's when it gets siloed. I think that's right. And the best organizing transforms you along with it. Yes, of course. The problem is in seeing things as individualistic, when what organizing is is a process of collective action you know i don't see us separating individuals from the collective like as siloed atomized objects but i do see like you cannot stay in the realm of the individual and call yourself an organizer that's that is just frankly bullshit yeah before we like zoom back out i want to stay on you and that that kind of evolution of the relationship between head and heart and i'm curious like in the last you know as you've 
moved back to New York and been in kind of this next stage since we last talked. Has that changed in any level, like your the relationship between those two things? Are you feeling that different being back around yeah. family you were talking about before you left? Is How's that been involved? Feel being back at the crew. Well, I'm always adapting to new things. I'm always adapting to change circumstances. Um, my mother is living with me um, now, which was unexpected. You know, I'm trying shout to, out to moms. shout out yes. to moms. <laughs> moms is awesome. We're about to make t-shirts. That's right. That's, nice. That's right. That's right. Um, so so that has like shifted some of my plans. And what I saw myself as doing in in um, kind of neutral ways, um, and I am also traveling a lot. So I'm not in New York as much as I had hoped I would be, yeah. and part of that has been, you know, the elections had a huge impact on shifting my plans. Mm. Um, and this year was supposed to be my year technically quote unquote <laughs> off. Yes, it was. Just it was one supposed more way to, that everything I mean, <laughs> it was, he's That's just, <laughs> it was supposed to be my year off because I'm on a fellowship right. and I was supposed to be taking this year to be doing some specific work I've been wanting to do myself. Mm. And that has shifted markedly. So, you know, I've gotten lots of calls from young organizers and people. Can you come to this convening here? Can you uh, come and help us figure out this thing? And there have been meeting upon meeting upon meetings. And so I've said yes to a lot of that stuff. So I think I still don't really know what it's like to live in New York yet again. Um, and I think if you ask me in a year from now, I'll have a better sense because I'm not really connected to local organizing in New York right now. And um, the only way I know how to be able to like set, make a sense of myself as an organizer is to be involved in organizing. So I'm not sure like what New York is right now. That's, is, is this, that feeling been like perpetual in your life of, of like... We prioritize. I need to set some time for me and my yeah. interests. Uh, and then the, wor- the conditions the always change. Turns you got to catch up. Don't pause. Right. So, so, I'm, so I'm in that point right now, personally, where I'm like trying to develop space and structures collectively. Yeah. And, and then allow me to do the work that I want to do for me. But yeah. I have this fear that I'm going to always be doing the building of, yes. of the collective. And so has that been like the last 25 years of your life? Have you been it's always just saying next year I'm taking a year off? And, first or have you ever got your year off? I've never gotten my year off <laughs> and I've never said I was going to take a year off. Okay, this was the first time. This, was my fir- this is the first time in my life that I actually made a conscious decision and that I could feel like I could also be supported in that because I had this fellowship. Because I think the thing to understand about, at least for me, is I've always had jobs and then my work. Right. Only recently in the last like nine or 10 years that my job and my work intersected. So for most of my life as an adult, I worked. Like I had nine to five, not never nine to five, but you know, I had like jobs. Yeah, that I was doing that people expected me to like, you know, show up for and I supervised people and I whatever. And I organized. When I founded Project Nia, it was the first time my work and my job intersected. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's also something to think about. I always tell people, I'm like, it's a luxury if you feel like you can organize full time. As a young person, most people have to like pay for their rent and get health insurance and live. This other stuff is your almost like your side hustle is your organizing. Um, And so that that's always been a struggle. So this was my first time trying to officially kind of take time for myself to do my own thing. Um, And that's just it hasn't worked out. Um, And I'm not upset about it. So please like know that it's not something that's causing me. (laughs) Stop calling. You know, (laughs) and also it's not like causing me like deep anxiety and I'm not having existential angst about it. And I think it's important sometimes to experience your life as it's happening and take it for what it is without having so much anxiety that like, am I doing it right? Is it happening now? Is it like things are going to happen? So like in August, I'm taking a month off where I'm going some, you know, where I'm going somewhere else that's not New York and that's not Chicago and that's not a place where I know anybody. And I'm going to try to work on something that's mine that well, I'm I hear doing. they're having a whole bunch of organizing meetings in August of that <laughs> month. I'd really love it if you could swing by and they could just pick your brain. No, and share, you know, no. So I'm doing that. So I'm making an intentional kind of thing for myself. I've already planned it out. I'm ready to go. Are you comfortable articulating what 
some of those things for you are that, that I'm going to be doing, in, in or that or that you were thinking about doing this year. The the things that that I really wanted to do. You. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've been wanting to do has been to intentionally carve out time for myself to write something that is beyond like a blog post or an article, but something that kind of delves in deeply in in a topic area that I'm interested in um, and tries to flesh it out. So I've, I really wanted to take this year to really focus on that. And I didn't know if it will turn into a book or not, but that I just wanted to write in that kind of way and, and reflect on what I've been experiencing, uh, the moments that I've been in right now, lessons that I'm learning. Um, and so the the month that I'm going to take off is going to be an attempt to see if I can spend enough time kind of focusing to write something that I feel is good. Mm. You have like a specific process or does it just pour, pour out of you? I, you know, I've just never had just a lot of time to do it. Right. So I write fast. I tend to write in a polemical way. You know, I'm, I write to make points, right. um, but I've not had a chance to just like, put myself and take time and think about craft or yeah. think about like writing a great paragraph or like, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm not a writer like that. Sometimes people have called me a writer and I think it's just cause I write. Right. Do you know what I mean? That's usually how it That's what it is. It's just cause I write, but like, That's I'm an not, understandable mistake on their I part. I know, I know, but it's, it's cause I write, but like, I'm not actually a writer in that sense where like, I, I think about craft and agonize over words and like, I'm, you know, no, I'm like actually a, an, uh, an op-ed writer basically where I try to like make a point that is supporting my organizing. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because we we were just in a <laughs> Damon and I came very late to a, a workshop that you were just doing on exhibitions uh, as part of as movement part of building. movement building, and one of the things that really struck me was I was thinking about uh, you as an artist and you in the artistic mind and creative side of that. So it's interesting to hear you say that like specifically pen to pad or yeah. typing. That's not the the way you think about that yeah. craft, but so much as I'm thinking more and more about what you do is you are a, you know, a multimedia creator right? in terms of what the tools are that you use. Yeah. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about this intersection of art and organizing and all this stuff, but mm -hmm. what kind of things craft wise do you like really love to live in as, mm -hmm. a, as a process, as a practice? Well, but I mean, I do, I, I've been journaling since I was a teenager. So I, I have like hundreds I mean I don't know how many you still have them all? Oh, I have so many of them um, some of them are lost because of moves and stuff like that but a big chunk my brother kept uh, a chunk down in his basement area and recently I went and looked at the trunk and it's got a whole bunch of my diaries in it mm. from the time I was like 14 mm. um, and you know and I looked at some of those diaries and it was like oh my God, I'm the same person. I am. Like, I really That's am. Powerful. The things I cared about deeply, I care about today. Like, the way that I thought about myself in the world is still the same way that I thought myself. So that was a great, that's so like, wonderful. that's a gift, right? So affirming. That's it. it is. Yeah. That was it. So that was a great gift. But um, I think that I see myself as a builder of containers. Hmm. And within those containers, I use anything that's available to me to try to communicate to other people. I build containers for people to come together to do some stuff together. And th as part of that, I write when necessary. I make short films with people as necessary. I organize exhibitions of art, of other people's art, if necessary. I, you know, I try to use every possible way. I will, you know, use audio uh, tools, as needed, all, the, all media. the media and all the tools. I'm completely, you know, at most, both agnostic about it and very uh, excited about it. And also because I'm super curious, mm. I love to learn yeah. I will be a lifelong learner. I will, it doesn't have to be in a school setting, yeah. um, but I, I'm just, I'm so fascinated by the world. So I want to talk a little bit, kind of coming off that, you, you mentioned this year uh, or, or since the election, the plans being changed. Yeah. And I love the way you talked about like not having the resentment about that, but just kind of like letting life, shift. letting life do it thing, and then yeah. reflecting and adapting to that. Yeah. So I'm curious, just, you know, just from the, the, the constant Twitter reading that I do, of your <laughs> of tweets. whatever you want to call it the, the my tweet feed. stream yeah. yes yes um i i have kind of felt you know and this is partly because this is where the kind of larger political conversation has shifted so much more to stuff in relation to federal electoral politics mm -hmm. and, and so i'm curious for you because that wasn't you know when we first 
or when I first became exposed to your work, kind of mm -hmm. the framework, and it is something that it feels like you're talking about more. Has that been like a conscious choice? Is that like adapting to the conversation? What, what, what's, what's that been like? I respond to the world we currently are living in. Um, and right after the election, I noticed folks were overwhelmed, scared. I had people on Twitter, like basically uh, DMing me, saying like, what are we going to do? Like what? you know i think people were just shocked yeah. a lot of people and i think the people who say they knew what was going no i think most people were surprised um, because even though they knew uh that there were people that were support him and that they existed uh, the idea was that there'd be more of others who wouldn't like there were more of quote us than them i think that's right. people's ten tendency even not us, just even like the, the moderate liberal yeah I'm that's what i'm saying but just like there like was the more on the yourself. other yeah. side that we're not going to vote for him you know like that that that's kind of his myth so people were really hopeless and um feeling a sense of like well, we don't know what to do we don't know where to go we don't know how to start um and so i've just been responding to that more yeah. the question of like what can you do and right now you're needed to fight on the federal front around you know them not repealing the ACA you're needed to push back against a Jeff Sessions appointment which will trickle down to the local you are needed there are all these places and so i began to make these uh daily five points of things you can do mainly to just also discipline myself to do them mm -hmm. And that turned out to be something that other people appreciated because they were like, oh, here's some concrete ways that I can transform my anxiety into action. And I didn't really know where to start. Um, and that's also when right after the election, I started saying they're going to repeal ACA. That's fine. We don't need to be in a defensive crouch over that. We need to do defensive organizing while we are also visioning a better alternative, and that's Medicare for All. Yeah. So that's when I started the, the Fight for Medicare Day of Action on the inauguration day that I was like, let's use the inauguration day to talk about Medicare for All. Let's push that. And I've been so amazed and thrilled that the call has been adopted by so many people on the left for Never this is a, we're saying that before, right yeah. and this is the moment y'all like we need to demand what we want in this moment this is the moment to be maximalist yeah. this is not the moment to actually shrink back and ask for little things yeah. i've loved the fact that that's been the we, we're fighting on a different ground yeah. and i feel part of that yeah. and i knew that immediately i knew immediately the day after i was like this we got a shift I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it with a digital organizing platform yeah. and I'm going to be part of that. So it doesn't mean that I'm not continuing to do local work. I am. Sure. And, you know, I was part of, uh, I went to Atlanta in January, um, was invited for a convening by the movement for black lives policy table and color of change to talk about what are we going to do about bail mm -hmm. um, and ending bail, cash bail. And, and, and for me ending pretrial detention and you know, I was in that group and of course I was the oldest person by far with like <laughs> one other person who was older. Um, and, uh, and it was important for us to have been in that room. You know, I always sit back and then interject only when I feel like there's a reason for mm -hmm. interjection. Um, and I was able to push for us creating a, a collective and collaborative curriculum around bail and ending cash bail. Mm. Um, Mary Hooks brought up the idea in that meeting about bailing out black, black mamas. And I was like, this is perfect, free them yeah. all. Like, so we were able to kind of get something on the ground that intervenes in that larger conversation about ending prisons in a concrete way that people can take up in their local communities yeah. since bail and bond is at the local level. Yeah. So it's, it's doing both. Yeah, yeah. And then even like the news a few days ago of, of like Jay -Z, Jay Z kind of expanding that model and doing the Father's Day. For the Day, Father's Day, but which is in like it can't and, be dismissed. And of how citing and he cited Ruthie yeah. Gilmore right. as one of the thing people like so now people are gonna pay attention to Ruthie's work and her work is critical to our modern understanding of abolition. And that inbox is blowing up. <laughs> there, was a Ruthie, there was a Ruthie Gilmore inbox. So so to like getting, to, the, getting so, the shout out there. So, so yeah. <laughs> shout out Ruth Ruthie. So to that point of, of like we're, we're we're kind of talking about the you know the shifting in conditions after the the election and after inauguration, and the, you know there's kind of not a tension, but for lack of a better word, kind of a uh, a tension of it being really important that there's this like mass political activity and mass you know education, but then also maybe some concerns of like a dilution 
so to speak, mm -hmm. or like, you know, what happens when you open up the floodgates. Mm -hmm. So you, you get certain contradictions. So you, you use the word interject. And I think you do a good job, not just in like physical space, mm -hmm. but kind of on the digital landscape of keeping your pulse on like what's happening in the country mm -hmm. and lovingly just saying like, we might be getting this wrong mm -hmm. or let's look at this differently. Sure. So are there things right now that have been itching at you, you know, as we have, you know, 250,000 people shutting down cities on, a, on mm -hmm. a, you know, inauguration day? till now um, that like we can maybe crystallize our focus or have a better understanding or use different language in yeah, our understanding you, of the time the right words now. Wrong to describe, whatever it is. Yeah, I don't know. I will say this. Um, I'm not precious about kind of local organizing being, I don't believe in the hierarchy and also the romanticization of that. Mm. Like I, I actually like in my bones, I like I reject it. And I reject it in this way that a lot of people who seem to actually not know, like use organizing and fetishize it to the micro level. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> like, and that, that that somehow like will trickle up nationally. We desperately need national organizing mm -hmm. in this moment. Yeah. Like we need big, huge demonstrations of our power. Like I feel like that more than ever. Mm. I don't want us to shrink ourselves in this moment because we actually lose power that way. I think it's important to do that on the ground level stuff. I believe local stuff is important. But I think right this minute, we need the SNCs and the cores and the NWACPs of the past. We need the national, you know, and we just don't seem to have that. Yeah. in the ways that we did before. We don't have like the big national mobilizing entities that could bring people together fast in terms of the, the thousands and millions of people. And we desperately need that. So I'm, I'm, I'm wavering between like, yes, like I'm really inspired by people's local work and can we just get some big organizing? Yeah. <laughs> can we get some like national pull we need numbers yeah. uh we really need numbers right now that's really interesting i'm thinking you, you mentioned like the snicks and the cords of the of the past for this moment and i'm thinking about just in general either actually like on the right or the, like there yeah. isn't we're not we're just not talking about like single name organizations at any point at like any that, point that model and it's something i think probably has to do with like dissipation because of the internet and like i think don't, so you don't sign up for you sign up for a, a day, you click subscribe. You That's don't right. Sign up for, to for, be a member. Like a, yes, to be yeah. a member that actually like consistently shows up yeah. every time your big thing calls. I wonder right? if that's also partially because of how, and I, this may be a jump, but like being a formal member meant that folks got targeted in really direct ways. Right? I think so you have your your role of who's there. Yes. They know who to they go They know after. who to go after. I think that's right. And I think I understand decentralization as important and valuable. I do. I get it. And boy, do we miss having those, you know, boy, do we miss that. And I think digital organizing substitutes for that in some ways, but it's episodic. Yeah. We need that. We need like that container that's this. Um, yeah. So that's a little bit about like what I wish we could have more conversation about for real. I think you all tried to do that with the RB three Chicago R3, yeah. you know the R3 Chicago thing was to try to like have an umbrella mm -hmm. thing that could mobilize a lot of people and I don't you know I wasn't there so I don't know like what that all turned into or how it was organized or whatever but like th more than ever we need that yeah yeah and it seems like the model that people are willing to at least like think about that in is not how can we all be one thing but right. it's how can we have like a formal coalition Th um, yes. That, like we will call ourselves a coalition before we will call ourselves one big thing. That's right. That's you know? right. Exactly. And you know, uh, yeah. Little, little by little, figuring it out what works. So I want to. Um, well, I'm thinking you. Yeah, wanna, I, I, I want to go back to the '90s stuff. Yeah. Uh, no, I want to. I want to stay with you a little bit because I think it's very easy to like just pick Miriam's brain. <laughs> uh, but but I, I want to know like a little bit more about how you're doing and like, do you get opportunities to like have joy for joy's sake and i also hear you talk a lot about like the importance of relationships within organizing um and so do you see yourself having the opportunity to have relationships outside of like movement-based connections or has your life kind of been so synergized that the movement 
is your actual pure relationships or do you just get to have like folks mm -hmm. that are talking about abolition that are just you know yeah. living day to day life checking in on each other well i mean i i live i have i have family and i certainly have friends that are not movement people mm -hmm. um yes absolutely but the most uh meaningful uh, relationships that I do have are people who care about the world specifically, um, whether or not they're engaged in movement mm -hmm. work. My family is my family and not most of them are not engaged in, in various things. So I, I love them and, and we have relationships and, you know, my nieces and nephews, like everybody, that's part of my life. But the people that I feel like are my people are people who fight for liberation too in whatever ways those those manifest themselves. I think people would say, who have kind of organized alongside and with me over the years, will say that one of the things I have stressed all along the way is celebration. Mm. You know, I think people have learned that from me, uh, frankly, in, mm. in a lot of ways, like that we accept small wins as times when we actually should celebrate. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in... The spaces I'm in, you know, it's me who brings people's birthday cakes and makes sure that everybody is celebrating that milestone in people's life. It's me who is calling us together to remember where we've come from. Um, it's part of why I care so much about history and a reminder of that. It's been years and years and years of me making spaces for teach-ins and other things like that that aren't necessarily about just pouring stuff into people's brains, but creating spaces for discussion. It's You know what I mean? Like So to me, um, joy is in the doing of things together that will eventually get us free. Mm. I can be happy about like the Hallmark Channel and knitting and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> I enjoy those things. I love to watch movies I like I have fun you I'm know say you said those two things like that's like a category of I feel like the Hallmark Channel is a singular the Hallmark thing. Channel is super important to me <laughs> yeah. you know let's get into I, it what, no, what do you I mean I just I just love I just love things that don't make me have to think Mm. I'm not thinking about the political ramifications of those movies, yeah. which are super racist, yeah. sexist, and all that other stuff. Like, I don't even hey, think about it. Off. I just turn it off, you know? It's like how I, I got through school through reading romance novels, you know? Yeah. And I'm not a romantic person. This is so, it's actually really important, I think, for both of the, yeah. specifically the two of us here, because that's we're, exciting to hear that we're that's both possible. like people who live <laughs> up here yeah. constantly, like, yeah. whether it's in action or in not yeah. in a moment of action. Yeah. And... You know, I think it actually goes back to what you were saying about the head heart relationship mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of like to the body as a whole. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you forgive yourself for getting out of here for a while? I don't even know? forgive myself. I just do it. There's no, there's it's no not, there's no forgiveness. Was it, let's say, at the beginning? Cause never. Least, never? It was always like you knew that that was important to you? I, of course. Yeah. I always knew that I had to enjoy my life mm. while I was fighting for things that are important to me. And this probably came from mentorship young, which is like, I always have believed in the importance of celebration yeah. of commemorating our time together. Mm. Again, it's me who, you know, at the end of a process that we were all in together brings in a series of stones that I use for myself to gift to the people who were in the room with me about something that I saw in that to that b relates to how I feel and th think about them yeah. you know that has just been part of who I am it's part of my practice it's part of my being it's my understanding of how we can work together and live together and be together yeah. um so I don't yeah I don't feel guilty about reading romance novels at all I think that more people should read them. Mm -hmm. They're trash. <laughs> Do you know? They are garbage. There's not anything deep. It's like how I feel when I'm knitting or crocheting. I'm just on it. Yeah. You know? It's something to like, yeah. yeah. How about for you, Dan? Have you found anything yet that's like the, you can... I think basketball has been that for me. So like the playoffs and the finals and just like being able to have that like barbershop style like yes. LeBron, Kevin Durant debate. Yeah. And like still be analytical, right? It's yeah, like, but think about the same tools. Yeah, but, but like to like not be about like death, you know? Yeah. I used to do this. I used to gamble on, on games. Like I was... Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> How yeah. uh what's the most you ever won and what's the most you ever I've, lost? I won a lot and lost a lot. <laughs> Did you I come stopped. out you think you came out even? Or? No, I came out ahead. Oh. Um, I was I'm a I was a really the reason I'm a good uh gambler is I managed my dad's um stock portfolio for years. So like wow. I was oh yeah. There's a whole part of me y'all don't lots of parts of me you don't know. 
That's but yeah, it's kind of crazy because mm-hmm. like that like that was a big part of my like early life. Yeah, of like, yeah. financial literacy. And yeah, those things. I got like a lot of attention. In a way that was kind of like difficult or weird for me as like you know my analysis of capitalism. Yeah, developed. yeah, of, like being like a like poster child as a young boy. Yeah, of like black capitalism. Mm-hmm. And so when when was that era where you were like? I did. I that. was doing that for a long time. I mean, I I stopped gambling in part because it became so so consuming. Mm. Like I would gamble on like all the Oscars, you know. Oh wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've always been competitive. Okay. Mm. So it's That's... part of my nature of like I like to like mark things. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I won undeniably. I like I like that. I like to win. Yeah. Like I just I really I do. This is a really interesting <laughs> Some, as, the, yeah. as the baby. Yeah. <laughs> Child exactly. care is important. Child care. <laughs> Some it's on audio. It's that is work. But I think that's actually like really interesting. You said that you've always been competitive because we've talked about this. We're both people who played sports in high school <laughs> and have felt certain kinds of uneasiness <laughs> about Obviously, like there is the the level at which, you know, competition gets wrapped up in all types of other things. Mm-hmm. But like learning how to take the tools of that and mm-hmm. not be consumed by it. Right. You know? Yeah. This is why betting and gambling was helpful. Like I was doing it against myself. Mm. I don't envy anybody. Mm. I don't. There's nobody in the world whose life I look at and I think I would want that life. Wow. Not a single person. And it doesn't, it's, it has nothing to do with money or whatever. It's like, oh, they have a car that's nice. I'm like, oh, that's a nice car, you know? Like, but like, there's not a, I don't compare myself to other people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like, I go against myself. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm interested now in my next season. Like, what am I going to do yeah. that's going to be better than what I've currently been doing? It's like the way you talked about the writing piece, right? Of like, let's see. If I can yeah, do I'm, this. Yeah, and I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to take the month, but That's let's right. see if I can actually do let's it. Let's see yeah. if I can do it. Like, it's not like, so, oh, my friends have 300 books out. Mm-hmm. I should have 300 books. Like, that is not how I torment myself. Because, God, would that be a miserable experience yeah, yeah. where you're always outwardly focused and looking at what other people have and then trying to get that. Right. Like, I'm so uninterested in that, but I am super interested in pushing myself to get better. Yeah. I'm interested in improving. I want to know if I can. Like, I want to push myself in that way. Yeah. yeah. It's such a balance to the hubris of, like, knowing you can do something you've never done versus believing you. You know, yeah. Louis C.K. has a great line of, like, they asked him about doing a special each year, and he goes, well, I'd never done it before, but I had done things I'd never done before before. <laughs> That's exactly right. It's exactly right. Because of my curiosity, I'm always going to be in that mode. Yeah. Like, I don't think, I mean, I'm going to be 80, and I'm going to be like, oh, can I do that? Is that possible? <laughs> yeah. Let me try. You know what I mean? Like, that's it. Because like, I, But I don't care about, like, your life is so your life. Mm-hmm. The inputs that you have had, the things that you have had as your benefits and the things that you've had as your detriments are uniquely yours. Even if we have things in common from where we came from, you are just you. Right. I'm never going to be able to look at you and be like, oh, I want to be Daniel. And I want to figure out how I'm going to do that. That's no, tough. I'm going to have touchstones. Like there are people whose lives I admire, mm. like the way they did X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. And I look to that and I think, ooh, like I want to publish some shit. I want to make some zines. Like I want to, you know, <laughs> Ida B. Wells made her own media. Like I totally want to make my own yeah. media, but it's not like to be Ida B. Right, Wells. Right. You know what I mean? Like well, That's actually uh, a, a, good, a good, yeah, a good, a good point. One well, yeah, the lineage for sure. Um, but as you kind of have brought up history and, and curiosity, uh, there's like a big question for myself that I've been very curious about. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's bigger than like you can answer. So just mm-hmm. whatever piece you could come up with. Uh, but I'm trying to have a better historical understanding of the 80s, 90s and 2000s. Mm-hmm. Uh, because for me, I did not grow up with like, I didn't know organizing existed, right? Mm-hmm. Like that language was not in my purview. Mm-hmm. Um It was the 60s and 70s. And I think we have a very good historical understanding of like 1492 to about 1974 (laughs) Uh, in terms of like resistance movements and Mm -hmm. radical politics. And so when I was in school and starting to become politicized, a lot of the questions was like, why did the black power movement end Mm -hmm. or fail if that was like a more provocative question? Mm -hmm. And where are we now and how could it be recreated? Right. But with kind of this assumption that there's been this 40 years of this absence. Right. And as I've gotten into the work 
and I'm starting to meet like, oh no, it didn't go away, right? It just had to get splintered. And obviously it was under great attack and there was so much trauma yeah. and so much persecution. Sure. Uh, but I, I just want like a better understanding of what happened post like 75 that is that yeah is, there's so much documentation of i don't think we know really where we the don't. movement was the last 30 to 40 years pre- yeah 2012, you know yeah no i think that there's um that is my uh growing up years um yeah so like my coming of <laughs> yeah i mean no my coming of age was in those in those decades but i think you know we were we were singularly marked by hiv aids mm. as like literally the plague Mm. of our time and i don't think people understand who didn't grow up in this moment of like how scary it was to think that there was something you could catch a disease out there that no one knew what it was that there were no there was no name for but your friends were dying around you in like people significantly we Mm. came uh, of age in the moment of deinstitutionalization of all of the mental health facilities. Right. We talked about last, we talked about, last about the homeless epidemic. That was in the middle of our, we came of age in a time of like racial tensions and police shootings and killings. So like we came of age with Reagan coming to power in 1981, which shifted everything. We came of age in the height of the anti-apartheid movement. Like people act like racial justice and internationalism ended in 75 right. <laughs> and then got picked up again in 2012. But like that was the fight. Most people who went to colleges were fighting on anti-apartheid. Mm. Like that's what you did. Yeah. Like, like now people are coming to college and they're fighting on, you know, DAPL or yeah. right. Black Lives Matter. Right. Like the work we were doing in the early 80s through the you know early 90s until Nelson Mandela was finally freed was anti-apartheid justice work. Um, so I, for example, went to college and, and ran the uh, Southern Africa Committee. Mm-hmm. That was the committee I joined to end up running before I joined the Black Students Network. Wow. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. So like the whole ACT UP, right. like people don't actually read about what ACT UP did, yeah. but as an example of a successful movement, that was like our example of people doing die-ins right. of the, the memorial quilts on the lawn hundreds and thousands of names on that quilt. Like all the things that are the direct actions of disrupting board meetings and the bankers and like all that stuff. Being outside the FDA and- Oh my gosh, right? Like that's the moments that we were in. The the founding of the Malcolm X grassroots movement um, that put out the 28 hour, every 28 hour, like that is of the late 80s into the 90s. Right? So why do you think we understand it or have historicized it kind of as a vacuum? Because people erased? haven't written about it yet okay. enough. It's still, it's it still, hasn't it's, moved from memory to history Exactly, yet. exactly. And it is memory and it isn't yet history. And people haven't dissected the, the lineage from the 1970s into the 80s, into the 90s. Like, who were the people who moved? You're going to find out in 50 years that a lot of the people who were doing work in the 70s show up again as leaders and mentors and teachers of the people who learned in the 80s. Then when we look at 50 years ahead of that, you're going to all of a sudden there'll be all these people that you knew personally in some way who will be in that history about like the link between them to the Trayvon Martin and to Troy Davis and to why people are talking about abolition. They're going to be the people who are ahead on that. So like, that's just the history, yeah. you know, that's are, are just there things you could like, as the books are, are getting written and getting outlined, are there like notable figures or orgs or formations that we should, we should think about in that lineage? Well, I just mentioned yeah, the Malcolm X yeah, yeah, grassroots, right, right, yeah, you, you know, group. You, you I just did. mentioned, you, you, you did. Yeah. You yeah, yeah. Question. So like, I think that <laughs> those, yeah, it's okay. Those are the groups. Uh, and there are many, many more groups that came up uh, that time, the black student leadership network, mm-hmm. uh, network of kind of college age, black people who uh, were brought together for by Marion Wright Edelman to reform the freedom schools. Mm-hmm. Those people, Nicole Burroughs, Paula Rojas, they went and on went on to found Sister to Sister in Brooklyn, which is the precursor oh, yeah. to everyone talk about black f- queer for feminist organizing. Sister to Sister was the template for that. All the folks who came together to found in 1997 to found Critical Resistance. All the people who came together in 2001 to found Insight. All the like all the language that people have today that you're all talking about when you say things like the system isn't broken, it's working exactly as designed. <laughs> That's Critical Resistance. All these like, were- you owe it to that. 
bad. All you know what I mean? We're acting like we made up. But, yeah. I mean, like, like that, but yeah. that's that's why you know it right. is because people made it. Which is something you, you right? said uh, that was very funny, but also like very true. Yeah. It, it, towards the end of your workshop, of like everybody kind of now wanting to get paid or, or get a stipend <sighs> or honorary for ideas that somebody can be invented in 1930 <laughs> <laughs> and did it better. <laughs> did it better. So yeah, so are you, so you're in it actually. You're learning uh, that history from the people who were making it. Yeah, which is such a wonderful joy to get to do. Mm-hmm. You mentioned lineage, and it's one of the themes that comes up every episode. We've, you know, identified a few things that over 100 episodes routinely come up, and that's kind of been a central one. So I'm curious for you, um, and I, I recognize this can be an ever-evolving thing, mm-hmm. but when you think of lineage, maybe on the ideas end or even just relationally, like, in whose lineage do you see yourself? That's so hard. <laughs> well... Wow, we, those are I know <laughs> the hard questions. Wow, that is so hard for me to say because both in uh, people I've gotten to work alongside of, organize alongside of, have influenced me a great deal. In you know, a lot of people in history, I've I have as touchstones, if not like as actual mentors. But the work around kind of learning how to be black mm. in the U.S. I attribute to the nation of Islam and the the ways in which you're made to understand yourself mm-hmm. as proud of that. Mm-hmm. You know, like I had parents who instilled pride in me and then I had like people around me that also like really did that. And that was really helpful to me at a critically form- formative time. I think Angela Davis became a touchstone for me as I learned about her and particularly I learned about her in college. So like she became somebody that I started to be interested in and follow around and eventually get to meet and know, you know, like I just felt like she really has helped shape my thinking. Um, Ruthie Gilmore has helped shape my thinking. Barbara Ransby and her writing about black women shaped and reshaped and has formed for me like, a, a nexus of like how I want to also share those stories to I had people that were when I was uh, a teenager took me in hand you know who taught me about community based organizing I don't know if it's a lineage but I I don't know I have so much respect for all the folks like who are my contemporaries who uh, built insight yeah which is really so insight provided for me a political home in a time when I didn't have one anymore, you know, when I wasn't in the nation and I had changed my thinking about a lot of stuff. And when I wasn't, um, you know, when I just kind of was trying to find myself again in a political way, um, I really kind of found in 2002 at the second conference in Chicago, I found a whole group of people that all of a sudden I had like new affinity with Mm. and the ideas that they were espousing. I had been in exile or been exiled, exiled myself from the anti-violence movement, the anti-gender based violence Mm. movement. I had been disillusioned Mm. by it and I was trying to find new things and I was getting to know more about restorative practices and I was, but I was just getting there and then that space kind of coalesced it for me. So that's been a hugely important political home for me. And you start to see those things not just reflected back, but fleshed out and worked out around yes. you. Yes. These little kernels, these little seeds. All of a sudden it was like, oh. Finally. Yes. I'm home. Yeah. You know, this is what I've been fighting against. This is what I've been fighting for. This is like the language I needed. This was the lens that made sense of things for me, you yeah. know? And it goes back to something you said in passing earlier you know, healing and processing and organizing being our, you say, you know, organizing is something you do for other people Mm -hmm. that does benefit you, which is, can transform transform, you, which is okay. And it's good. Yes. Um, And I think that that's something that it takes, at least it's taken me a bunch of time to, to be thinking about and figuring out. I think it's something that sometimes people feel, I won't project. It's something that I've felt, (laughs) you know, challenged to do is, like accept, recognize, and celebrate. It's not selfish to be engaging yourself. Yes. Well, then to be feeling joy for those. But things, how you could know? you not? You're a sentient being, right. and you're everywhere you go. There you are. Right. I mean, you oh. like I just, but <laughs> yeah. like I don't under like I don't understand the the need for bifurcations right. like that. Right. That that like somehow people need to feel like they're compartmentalizing their lives in these ways, and this is where I am to do this, and this like no. 
your family is part of who you are. So it's part of your life and your work and your organizing. Your community is part of who you are. And that's going to be that you're never going to be able to be this atomized human being that has all these different parts. And now I'm self caring. And now I'm like, and this is some capitalism. I mean, it's exhausting to people. I see young folks killing themselves, exacerbating already existing depression, like over this stuff. Why? It's hard to live. It, it's hard to live in this in this culture. Yeah. It is hard to make a living. It is hard for you to not be poor. Our systems are anti. The systems are really they're death making. So like, why are you gonna also cut yourself up into so many different pieces? Mm. Be guilty about everywhere. Wherever you go, there you are. You will move to Tennessee to get away from whatever, and you'll find yourself the same person in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's a, the your no your your tensions are real good traveling companions. You know? <laughs> like they're you. just going to be there. Yeah. They're just going to be there. It's not that I just think we have to people have to calm down. Mm, so <laughs> that's a great I think that's like a great yes. calm like, down. If there's one I know we've talked for an hour, but yes. we could have just done 30 yeah. seconds. <laughs> breathe. Yeah. Just it's okay though. It really is and all more than that, if you build around you the structures and the people and the community you need, you will also be okay. Yeah. So definitely want to be aware of your time. And so I want to wind yes. down soon. Uh, but I do have two more questions I would like to end <laughs> with 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 our game. Okay. <laughs> um, so so Something that I'm hearing from what we're just in relation to what you're just saying. Yeah. I personally, for a few years, after like, you know, looking deeper at religion, started to reject concepts of spirituality on, mm. on the whole. Okay. Um, and have recently been like reframing and re-understanding and trying mm. to, you know, develop a, a personal understanding of the concept and, and how to put that into not well, I haven't even gotten to practice. Yeah. Yet, but just the understanding. Yeah. Um is, is spirituality a, a concept or I, something that's very that is, yeah, is hugely important in my life. A, do you have a language or a framework for how Well, you I'm Muslim. I was okay. raised Muslim. I practice, practice. Um and I believe in a higher being and a higher power. I don't know how I would live in the world if I didn't. This is just me. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just cannot believe that all of this was random. And that there's nothing beyond this moment is hard for me to believe. And I actually don't ever, I can't believe it. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't even make sense to me that there were just a random collection of atoms and this and that. There was just no higher power, however people define that, um, that the universe could be your higher power. But something else beyond ourselves, Mm, that's super, super important to me. My, my religion also dictates for me a code of conduct Mm. of how to act in the world how to be in the world how to treat other people in the world how to treat myself what i owe to others what is owed to me i don't know how i would navigate uh, the world if i hadn't had that at a young age and if i didn't fall out of the traditional religion for a while which i did I um absolutely that, absolutely and then refound myself again and refound those pieces and was able to distinguish between what is written and what can be interpreted and who the interpreters are yeah. like i was able to make that and then reread the books myself reread the quran myself with my own eyes and my own understanding and taking and make interpreting it my way um once i was able to actually do that and re-engage that and decide which parts of it i could leave behind and which parts of it meant something to me it made all the difference so it's really hard yeah. to do that with the faith practice that is the one that has been formative to you like, yeah um it is joseph campbell talks about like how the the advantage of of studying someone else's faith tradition is that you can look at it with a like fullness in your analysis mm-hmm. that you can't of your own because yeah. it's so wrapped up. Right. And it sounds like what you're doing is getting to a point where at least to some degree you can kind of like pull it out from right in front of your yes. face and look yeah. at it a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. And yeah. which parts are the ones that like belong to me and which ones don't? You know, it's like give back what doesn't belong to you, mm. right? It is I think a great kind of practice and an idea about everything Mm -hmm. it's Mm -hmm. like when somebody gives you criticism take the parts that you think belong to you and give the rest back right so (laughs) praise yeah yeah that's what i'm saying like take in what you think belongs to you Mm. and then give back Mm. what does not Mm. and part of the discerning of growing up and becoming a grown person in my opinion is to be able to figure that out for you what is what is for you you? what belongs to you and what does not because people project 
their own anxieties onto you. <laughs> oh, we know. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they make it like their jealousies, their pettiness, their whatever. It's all wrapped up in the same thing they offer to you. Everything's a projection. Everything is a projection in some way. But there are parts of projection, though, that are constructive and helpful. Yeah, because people, the only way we see ourselves, there's this thing called the looking glass self, mm-hmm. uh, a theory, a sociological theory by a guy named Cooley. And it, he basically suggests that the only way we understand self is through the mirror of other people. There's no Damon if there isn't Damon's parents who look at you and reflect to you who you are. Mm -hmm. So like just You hear that mom? (laughs) Right? Like and reflect to you and then you reflect back and it's back and forth. It's just like kind of back and forth. So that's how we understand ourselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's the same thing I'm saying about like what people offer to you. You don't have to take it all. It's some of it is garbage. And you, your job is to discern which parts are for you and which parts are for them it's to much return. Easier, much easier to do that parsing of something that someone else is giving to you than to do it for yourself. Exactly. It's, so yourself. it's hard yeah. for yourself, but it is certainly, I always take that. When somebody says something to me, I'm like, which part of this maybe <laughs> is, is true? Yeah. And I can hear and I want to process that. And which part of it is them? Right. That they need to work out some stuff, right? Yeah. 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 You have another... I did, I, did have, I did have one last piece. Okay. Uh, and, then, and then we'll we'll play our game and then go. <laughs> uh, you know, in the last conversation, one of our like most substantial, you know, inter- episodes we've had, mm-hmm. uh, we, we were very intentional on like defining the activism, organizing, like distinction mm-hmm. and also abolition as a concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you were very much in your teacher role. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, it was theoretical and like technical understandings of those concepts. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, it's a different season it's a different time beyond like what it actually means Mm -hmm. even just in the workshop you said you always have a vision of what it looks like for you right a vision a vision of what abolition looks like right of of, of the world that we're trying to create right and so what what are some of the whether it's like senses sights sounds formations it's been like nine months or so since we last talked um how is that concept of abolition looking for you how are you envisioning I th- how it's are you not imagining? yeah i don't think I, I envision it as like a thing like a, a place that i am at and like you know i'm walking down and i can smell the roses <laughs> right, and like right, right. i don't see that like that's not right, it's not a promise it's not that yeah it's not like a place mm-hmm. or like it's not like it, it's more of like i will know i'm living in an abolitionist future when everybody has the ability to self-determine their lives to be self-determining without constraint so like for example i imagine a a world where everybody has every material need met like no one is homeless no one can't access health care no one is uh hungry no one is in cages no one right the environmental uh, structure exists we're living in a symbiotic relationship with the land and the water and all like those are my visions of an abolitionist future but that's because i see that that means that we would have the ability to determine our lives Mm. without constraints and the constraints being oppression that makes it hard and impossible for people to be self-determining. So when people talk about liberation and what that means or freedom, those, that's how I think of it. I don't care about the trappings. I'm not like interested in how it smells. I don't know how it's going to smell. If I say how it smells, it's like, I like, you know, chocolate. So it smells like chocolate. (laughs) Like that's, you know, but, but the other stuff, the feelings that people will have because they can determine their own lives. That I is my vision. Right. And, and that's the thing I want, you know, and and so that's what I'm fighting for, which is why I always tell people that abolition is about much more. It's not mainly about dismantling. It's about building, but it's not just about building. It's about making the conditions obsolete for why we end up having to lock people up, for why we end up having to have people who are poor. Like we have to completely obliterate and make Mm -hmm. those conditions obsolete Mm -hmm. in order for that world to have a place to come in, for a door to open, for the light to come in, for us to be able to make that happen. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I see. And I think we should spend more time thinking about how we're going to bring into being a place where we have full living wage employment, a place where we can live and not be dying from being poisoned to death, a place where the everybody has access. Like, I think if we focus there, we're in it. We're in our abolitionist future, you know? That's beautiful. And mm-hmm. I think 
it leads maybe to the most important thing that we're going to talk about in this interview, which I want to give Damon the, the real opportunity to, to take us there. <laughs> so last time we uh, do the time and just reverence. We didn't we didn't get to <laughs> to where we where we where we should go. Uh, and yeah, as a listener, I, you know, I, th- I think you know where we're going. But oh, for, 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 for folks who, who may, I have beef yeah, with, for folks who may just have tuned in just to uh. to hear Miriam Cabo <laughs> every week, uh, we attempt to have accountability here on Ergo. Uh, there's a sect of the world that's run amok in my lifetime, and I and, and I won't stand for it. <laughs> I, what I has happened between 1973 <laughs> and 2012 in terms of R&B singers? It's so, actually an interesting parallel. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think there was a, a breakdown at the same time. <laughs> But every week, just, you know, for brevity, but also for real, because it's important. They, they run amok. We start beef with an R&B singer from any era. So I say, like, from David Ruffin to, like, <laughs> you know, this August Alcina, who's somebody out now. Oh my Is goodness. there anybody in the R&B ecosphere? I've I've already, everybody picks the beef? same person. Oh. R. Kelly's up. Exactly. Yeah, no, that, that's why everybody, we created the game. Everybody <laughs> picks for R. Kelly, he's but rap- he's really the person. Yeah. He's awful. <laughs> he's a monster. Okay, so let's say that he's just awful. <laughs> they change the game. Yeah. They just beat with R. Kelly. I mean, it's, it really is. I mean, he's just awful on so many levels. Um, I'm trying to think of who I would have beef with who's an R&B singer. Well, you know, there's... Um, um, what is the guy's name that was like he was stole somebody's lyrics? What was that guy's name? I lost my train of thought. No, he's from a, he, from when I was growing up. He was like a he was like a, he was no Millie Vanilli was like yeah. Are they R and B? I have beef with Millie Vanilli. Let's do that. That's perfect. That counts. Care to elaborate? No, no. Let's talk more. <laughs> Who thought? Who no. Thought? We have Miriam Cobb in 2017. I think that works. <laughs> <laughs> Millie Vanilli. Wow. Uh, we're like we've done that. our job yeah. here. That so as, as we close out, is there anything people need to know? Any plugs? I do want people to pay attention if they can. I'm I'm organizing with a formation called Survived and Punished. We've been involved in uh, the Free Brisha campaign and other campaigns to free survivors of violence. But I want people to check out our website at survivedandpunished.org, specifically because we're going to be releasing this week um, a series of videos Uh, very short videos that tell stories of criminalized survivors of violence. And we're also releasing a toolkit uh, for people who want to start their own defense committees to be able to do so. Those are two things that are coming out and we definitely want people to engage in and engage with and share their ideas back with us. Wonderful. Last thing, real quick, uh, as a ergo enthusiast, yeah, I'm hoping you may have some. Uh, you have people mad at us here. A, a little, <laughs> a little loving critique. What, uh, what, 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 what should we be doing better? Oh my God, an ergo critique. <laughs> Real quick. <laughs> no. Okay, no. we don't have to do that. We'll right. Cut that. We'll cut that. Like what I appreciate about it is you're like not making distinctions between like political art and quote real art Mm -hmm. and all this like it's just it's really refreshing and really I think the way the world works in very you know specific ways that like people are not these like atomized I've mentioned it several times but like it gets to me so much I think that's what the show does really well is like yeah even people who may come on the show and think of themselves primarily as artists they're doing a whole bunch of other things, you know, and like that, it, that comes through in, in these interviews in real specific ways. I also think you should make little, small, very short parts of your show available, like bite size ergo. We've been literally talking about this since before the first episode. And you're yeah, your like bite size ergo, you know, or like spark notes for ergo or mm-hmm. something because while I listen to every show because I'm an insomniac not every, some people not, sleep people sleep and like I don't think they can necessarily get the whole thing but I think you can definitely do something with like letting people you know get like little snapshots of things that you think are like the best part of that interview or whatever yeah so That's those are the well, thank you thank you so, so much for talking much love to me of course, of course. <laughs> yay Erica Oh, a pleasure. Oh, awesome. so much love. Much also, love. you should all subscribe and pay them money. Ooh, Good job. Cut the check. Cut the check. <laughs> the movement continues. <laughs> <laughs> much love to the people. This is for the last that's been taken. This is for our bodies that's been breaking and taken. Hold your head up high. 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 This is for the last that's been taken. This is for our bodies that's been breaking and taken. Hold your head up high. 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 Hold your head up high
Yeah.